Hi there, this is James Chai, RFR Park Park Rescue Foundation. Today is October 16th, 2019. This is vlog broadcast number 22. I've been doing this since September 24th and uh, getting um, a bit more focused on how I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm looking forward to um, going onward and talking about some of the things that we have today. Uh, this is about um, my work that I do with predatorial dogs, dysfunctional dogs, extremely dangerous dogs, etc. Uh, I hate to say things along the lines when I, uh, you know, add on the etc, etc, so forth to the end of my descriptions, because it's really about the dogs themselves, and I don't see the dogs as regards to the level of danger as per se. I mean, of course, if they're dangerous or, or more so, I want to be careful. I will be, but at the same time, I take with what is presented to me by the dog and by the human and I just work with it and I know sometimes people talk about a dog that has a medical issue uh, such as Gordon the Bulldog um, as well as other dogs that are uh, for example that are uh, that are beaten that have abuse issues that are uh, afraid or that they're intact what I do is work with these dogs at all times and I again I want to keep into context in my head the issues that the dog has, but I don't dwell on the fact that this dog is dangerous or that this dog is reactive or scared and so forth like that. Uh, being that I have such a, uh, a diverse uh, uh, skill set in regards to the spectrum of dogs, um, it's something that is for me, and let me just close this off here, uh, that is something for me which I just take as is. So I take the challenges that I'm given. Uh, because I have such a, a huge passion for the dogs that I work with, especially, you know, they, they're victims of human abuse and or human neglect. And so at the end of the day, I just take with what's going on. I don't try to make a big deal out of it. It's funny, I look at some of the uh, dog trainer uh, uh, groups and, you know, people are just looking at, well, if this dog is such and such and that's it, there's no issue. Uh, I mean, there's no, no no remedy. This dog can't be fixed, etc. And I think that that's a huge disservice from my colleagues to start looking at dogs and say, hey, you know what? There's a problem with this dog. We can't fix this dog. And so, oh, well, that, that's too bad. And the dog has to die. When we start categorizing issues that are happening with dogs, then we forget our humanity and we start to then um, dispatch dogs in such a callous way where it doesn't mean anything to me. Um, it is a really difficult thing that I, I, I deal with. Sorry, I'm just kind of looking at my screen here just to make sure that I have things in line. I've got some crib notes that I have written up here. Uh, so getting back to that part is I just deal with the dogs as is. Uh, I, I don't have a choice, right? Because the dogs are having a dysfunction. They're reactive. They're dangerous. They're skittish. They're scared. They're shut down. For me, I just deal with them. And, and I got trolled uh, uh, by a couple of children earlier, Spicer and uh, Era, um, the, and I think there's another one, Jolene, um, who, who are just like just trying to mock and make fun of things like that. And then they talk about their own advocacy and their own passionate belief for dogs. But in the reality, they don't really care. They don't. They're not out there to troll. They're out there to watch the world burn. And these are keyboard warriors. The courage comes from hiding behind a keyboard. But in person, they wouldn't have the courage or the humanity to make the same confrontational tones that they do, whether or not it's tacit or it's uh, overt, they just don't have it. Um, if anyone knows me, anyone knows me at all, I am quite opinionated. I am more than happy to state my opinion and I'm uh, more than well equipped to defend my position and to present and critically uh, 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 um, restrict what other people are saying in the sense that I can cut down what they're saying because they're just talking nonsense. And it's too bad because uh, the people who are looking to watch the world burn just want to watch the world burn. They have a, a sick satisfaction inside of them. Maybe their mommy didn't love them enough. Maybe their daddy left them. Something happened to them. And then they just go and lash out at the rest of the world. They're usually young, under 30, and then they go all off over the place. And it's too bad because these people have this uh, displaced passion have the ability to actually focus it on things. And maybe, you know, I can say when I was young and dumb uh, at their age, then I didn't know what I was doing. And it's true, but now that I'm older, I've learned a lot, and what I think, oh, well, I've wasted, you know, all these years being an idiot. Uh, and it's the ability to self-reflect, right? The introverted aspect of perspective, to self-reflect, to uh, kind of set ourselves away and see whether or not we can change. I do believe very much so that we are inherently uh, a certain type of personality and that we all have the ability to change if we really want to. And, you know, it happens. Just 
it, it's just uh, it's 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 a waste of time. It's it's frustrating to deal with people who are just really again wanting to watch the world burn, and then at the same time they're the first people to complain about why is this or why is that happening. And then when confronted with actual issues, they're like, oh well, what can we do? There's nothing we can do. So it's a keyboard courage uh, a lot of these warriors have. And I can't even call them warriors. I would call them again, just um, uh, children. Hi, Jamie. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, Jamie. I just, uh, I just uh, kind of fell behind. I was trying to figure out how I could do a screen share so we could do your pulse and at the same time. Unfortunately, it was just, it was just all off, I, and I can't figure it out. So I'm going to try to see if I can get a, a third-party app, and maybe I can do that because I want to do, uh, I want to discuss some of the other videos that I've gone through, Jamie, uh, in my own uh, life, uh, and the videos that I found here, and uh, and do it and um, uh, present it out there. So there's three different topics I'm going to talk about, plus I'm going to actually do Jamie's question as well with regards to uh, two of her, uh, her Danes, their giant dogs, right? And so I want to address that. So there's three topics here, and I, and I think I'm going to just pick one of them in the middle probably, but the three topics I was going to talk about today, the choices are, uh, the first one is, and it's relational to a few things, but uh, it is why dogs are afraid of bridges. And if you look at the uh, description in my live broadcast, all the stuff that I'm talking about, it's the pre-notes, you get to go through them, and then later on I'll go over them and I'll create keynotes, so that way it's easier for people to reference. I won't put timestamps on anything like that because, uh, you know, if you really want to know what I'm doing, you get to learn. The other thing is, I'm going to try to keep my post down to, uh, let me just turn this off, I'm going to try to keep my post down to about an hour, hour and 20 minutes, just because uh, I know it's hard for people to pay attention, and I do tend to kind of ramble on a bit as well, so, you know, Hey, you know, admitting my own issues is, is the first part of, uh, of, of uh, 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 getting over it. Okay, so the first one is going to be, uh, uh, like I said, I'm going to pick one of these three topics here as well. So it's going to either be um, this one here, why dogs are afraid of bridges, dogs coughing on leash, or it's not natural for dogs to take food from our mouths without trust. So the first one in that topic of the, 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 key, uh, the pre notes, why dogs are afraid of bridges, relational to their field of vision, Relational to their logic processing, relational to their historical context, relational to their understanding of physics. So that's a bit more of a, of a complicated topic. Um, doesn't always seem to be easy for people to understand, so I try to break it down in layperson's terms. And then the second subject matter that uh, I was thinking that I probably will do because it's a bit easier, a bit more palatable for people, would be dogs coughing on leash, lunging, darting, psychosomatic, seeing your vet, CBD, oil, and James. And then the third one is, it's not natural for dogs to take food from our mouths without trust, species-specific behavior, resource value and communication, as well as developing familiarity and trust. So these are uh, these are aspects there. I think I'm going to probably go with the dogs coughing on leash um, because I'm not going to have to be so, um, uh, uh, I can be more uh, straightforward about it instead. Um, for those of you who are watching, please share my posts. Please share my YouTube channel. I am doing this all for free. I don't get paid. I don't make any money. Uh, you look at my website. There's no ads on it. You know, you go to any any pretty well any website now, and you Google it. Uh, you, you pull up the Google ad. You look at it, and it's and, and the, the site itself is full of ads. You go on mobile with uh, places that have the news articles, and it's swamped full of ads uh, to generate income. And I get that, but in my case here, uh, how do I try to profess pro bono? Uh, uh, examples. I try to do this way. If I have to put ads on, eventually it will happen. Uh, I hope not, but if it does so, it's going to definitely be trusted sources, trusted sponsors, and so forth, but that's down the road. Um, so in the meantime, I'm asking people to please subscribe to my YouTube channel. The link is at the top of this description. Uh, I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers and um, it's it's just a it's it's hard. I'm at 451 now, and I appreciate the people who have subscribed. Um, and, and I love it. Jamie. You subscribed today. I saw that, and so I really appreciate these things that are happening for the support that's going on. And you know the value is there. Obviously, you, nobody's paying a penny for any of this. I'm providing uh, online vlogging, uh, down training advice. I normally charge for people who do hire me 140 dollars for an hour, and my Private sessions are $230 plus taxes on both aspects of it. So I, I do have an income, but I do a lot of pro bono. And you see I spend an hour to two hours here on the live broadcast. It takes me an hour to, to formulate what I'm going to talk about. 
instead of being organic. And then afterwards, it takes me twice as long because I have to watch the video again, stopping it every time to write notes down. So I'm upwards of four to six hours a day. And, um, you know, if I and I'm, tr I'm, I'm not trying to be famous as per se. I want my work to be known so it leaves a digital legacy. So that's why I ask people to share my work so it's out there because it'd be horrible if I'm, you know, in decades from now, I'm dead. And people are like, oh, you know what? James is right. Uh, every single person that has hired me, every single person that's hired me has seen 100% progress that happens. Thank you, Kim. And Kim, uh, yeah, I worked with Kim today with Blossom and Luke, and I remember their names, as well as um, she'll be getting River coming in from Bali in Indonesia, which is a very difficult place to get through. And Indonesia is a, uh, a very poor uh, standard of uh, animal uh, uh, compassion that's there. The, the animals are poisoned. There's places where people are touristy areas like Sunset Beach, I think, Kim, and people will throw poison there to kill the dogs. And it's absolutely horrific. So I am speaking out about a lot of things. I'm quite the advocate. Uh, uh, the Canadian election is coming up on October 21st. And the uh, change.org, I have a petition up there to criminalize dog and cat meat. Uh, over 105,000 signatures that I have now, and hopefully uh, my uh, member of parliament, Honorable Ken Hardy, who who met with me immediately when I asked him, hey, would you be willing to support this? Yes, and I met him uh, in his private office and everything, and he spent 15 minutes with me, which one on one, which is a lot of time for a politician. And uh, uh, Honorable Hardy is going to, uh, hopefully, he's re-elected. Re I'm asking people to re-elect uh, Honorable Ken Hardy. Um, then he will go on to present my um oh those speeches yeah um uh he will uh, Ms. honorable hardy will then go on to present our petition of 105,000 plus signatures to the uh, house of commons a political movement forward on what i'm doing here uh, i am still trying to go after the vancouver animal control in regards to discriminating against people with disabilities so i have that as well um yeah zeus zeus uh, i'll get to that that i'm probably gonna go on the dog's coffee on leash one it's probably the one that's it's gonna save a lot of people money um i sent kim you earlier uh in my messages back to you um no i'll, I'll get to that zeus um uh, but go ahead and you can guys can leave the notes and i'll just kind of pass them through um yesterday i said you know i can't read the the notes or the the comments what i meant was it's just distracting because anything shiny i'm like oh okay um, Kim, you probably know, right? I'm, I'm quite, quite aware of my surroundings, especially when I'm with a, a dog, right? When I'm with you and Blossom, it's pouring rain, I'm soaking wet, but I'm not worried about that. I'm paying attention to everything that's going on. And that's kind of the behavior because I'm paying attention at two tenths of a second. You're welcome, Zeus. I'm paying attention at two tenths of a second, watching everything. And I think Kim as well, you as other people can attest, I really am seeing the dog that fast. And it's not magic because you, Kim, yourself, were doing it yourself. Remember, I was like, look at your intuition's happening. You're doing it yourself. So it's not anything magical that I do. I've just spent significant time uh, with predatorial giants that can kill me. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, squirrel. And that for me, uh, when I'm dealing with dogs that are, are 150, 180, 140 pounds, I have significant bite histories that are standing right in front of me, 30 inches away from me, literally 30 inches away from me just watching me like a lion watches its prey from afar it's what they're doing in front of me so all these aspects i have learned these things where i have to pay attention to every absolute nuance and tiniest movement of behavior when you look at these people who are these successful salespeople, these huge multi-million dollar sales people and all that how they read other people incredibly tight it's the same thing we can do for dogs it's just that we're not realizing we can do that and nor are we realizing that dogs are reacting at one tenth of a second even faster than humans even faster than bruce lee who was tested at two tenths of a second faster than major league uh baseball players uh, that are processing uh you know at 0.25 of a second so that's over two tenths of a second and and like 25 one hundredths of a second because they already know where to the the, the the players the batters know where to swing the bat even before the, dog, uh, the, the ball has left the mound. That's how amazing these players are. And you're like, well, how can these, do it? these people do it? And then you have college guys who are able to play baseball that way, even just naturals. And we all have this natural ability of in, in using our intuition to read things like that. Um, <laughs> reading all these aspects of the behavior of, on, a, on a human side, we do it with animals. The problem is because we've been taught by the behaviorists, by Temple Grand, and by Ian Dunbar, by 
uh, by uh, uh, whatever the other one, uh, uh, Pryor, whatever her name is, Pryor, uh, Rebecca Ledger, all these people who are at the top of the food chain making a couple hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars and saying, well, you know, if the dog doesn't take food, the, the dangerous dog doesn't take food. We have to kill the dangerous dog. Every single dog. Uh, even Kim, you asked me today, I said, I have never refused a dog. It doesn't matter if I get trolled and faked by people. I can read whether or not within reason they're telling me the truth or not. If it makes consistency with the dog's behavior and the way the dog looks. And then I take that. And one of the things Kim said to me today, because I said to her, can you show me a picture of River who she's getting in from Indonesia next week? She said, well, why do you want to look at his, why do you want to look at her face? Why, why do you want to look at a photo of her? And I said to her, well, when you chose River, how many photos, did you, did you just look at her and that was it? And Kim's like, no. And I said, how many photos did he look at? And she's like, hundreds. And I said, there you go. So something made you choose River out of 100 plus photos, something connected to you. So for me, I do that when I look at that photo and I look at the photo going, what is it that I connect with? What is it that the uh, the, the owner connects with? What has she written down? What has he told me about her, um, uh, her their dog that they're getting or that they already have? And then I correlate that, I connect all the dots together, just like somebody who's a body behavior uh, expert, uh, a, a handwriting expert. Uh, there, there's, there's logical process in the way we write. There's intonation, there's cadence, there's natural rhythm that we go through, choice of words. We can tell when someone's writing naturally and then they're kind of adding on words or they're deleting words that are, uh, are sophisticated or not sophisticated to their natural uh, aptitude. Um, a whole bunch of things and then we create that uh, 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 picture, that photo, that cloud, that plasmic aspect within our head and the quantum type of processing and then we extrapolate that and that's called intuition. I read dogs faster because I had to learn how to read dogs faster, Zeus. I had no choice because I took on dogs that have significant histories and again you can look at the media information dog 180 plus pound dog that's attacked 16 people even an nypd officer who has all the experience military experience she, uh, she couldn't even handle him at all because it was, it was just too dangerous all the behaviors master dog trainers in north uh, in north america said dog's too dangerous a dog will kill somebody it will either kill them or one of their staff. The dog cannot be medicated enough, etc. I've worked with extremely old dogs, 10 plus years, giants uh, that people say you can never help, whatever. If we say we can't do something, we never can. We got a person on the, uh, we got a man on the moon. You know, even though Donald Trump said he wants to put another man on the moon for the first time again the other day, last week on, uh, at one of his rallies. But, um, we, we can do these things if we don't let ourselves be stuck by the wall that's put up by the other people, especially the people who are at the top of their game, who no longer have a reason to try. Case in point, people say about me, and they troll me, like I said earlier, can't do this, you know, he's always full of da-da-da-da-da, there's no way, dogs only respond to treats, etc., and all this stuff. And I say... Nowhere does food exist in the entire canine species as a communication device, much less a reward fiat, a reward Right? No dog, no wolf brings up a piece of food to the other dog, other wolf, and goes, here you go, you did a good job. Never happens. But because of Temple Grandin and, 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 and uh, Pryor, whatever her name is, Rebecca Ledger, no, the dog has to take food. Dog's got to take food. So you look at my Gordon the Bulldog, disabled, highly reactive, hasn't been picked up in 10 months, um, couldn't be touched whatsoever. The impossible dog, within seven zero seventy 70 minutes, I have him in my lap for the first time in his life he's ever been carried and he's not freaking out and you can see the progress in there uh, have minky out of 20,000 plus dogs saved by animal hope and wellness foundation from the meat dog trade the, the horrific aspects of abuse he's one dog known at their high uh, uh, um, shelter was able to deal with in los angeles and they've got connections to matt damon everything hollywood board of directors has a, a well-known uh, dog, master dog trainer behaviorist Nobody could figure him out. Took me less than 36 hours. The video's up there. It's in my promo up on the cover sheet um, as well. <laughs> Extremely dangerous dogs. Every part of it is I don't look at the fact of the danger without it relational to the dog's victimization and the behavior on a psychogenetic level. So that means the psychogenetic, so the psychology where that psychosis, that part of the dysfunction, where the disruption happens, where that flip, that change happens, 
break that down, figure it all out, and go from there. It's really easy. It's the same thing as uh, I say uh, to people, like I said to Kim today, um, you know, uh, with her she, she, with her boyfriend, I said, you can finish his sentences, right? And she goes, yeah. Intuition. So it's not... Don't think of dogs as just dumb dogs. Don't think of dogs as just stupid. They're brilliant. They can survive in the wild. They can react in one-tenth of a second. This is the reason why they can't survive. This is the reason why there's so many dogs versus limitation of humans. And we're still going, well, climate change, etc. All these things that we're, we're challenged with now. Population aspect of it and, and the level of criminality that's occurring within the populations and socioeconomic perspectives. All these things that are happening, but where we come down to the primal aspect of behavior, we're able to pay attention to what's going on with the dog. Okay, so uh, I'm going to kind of blast forward on this, um, and we're going to go to why uh, why our dog, uh, and I was going to do this like I said earlier, Zeus, uh, dogs coughing on leash. A lot of people will get their dog, for whatever reason, they're usually dysfunctional, right? They're, they're you know, skittish and all that stuff, and like, ah, rah, 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 and, and they're all upset and everything like that, right? And it's like, then they start coughing. And then what does the owner do? Oh my gosh. I better go to the vet because my dog might have kennel cough. Uh, he was fine inside the house and he was okay for the last three weeks and he hasn't been around any other dogs, but now he's coughing. Um, I want to also put in a scale, I'm talking about dysfunctional dogs, above average dysfunctional dogs. For all you trainers and behaviors and trolls that are out there, I'm not putting the trainers and behaviors with the trolls. I mean, the trolls are the ones who are just kind of like, I could say immature. Uh, but I'm saying to the trainers and behaviors out there, here's a way where you're going to actually be able to save your clients a couple hundred dollars worth of a vet visit. And when and now it makes sense why at the bottom, I say CBD oil and James. Not because of CBD oil, but because of something else. Okay, so your dog that's dysfunctional and is and is just wild on leash and is always yanking and lunging and all that stuff and they're always upset about something when they're going out for a walk. Most times your dog that is going to cough isn't coughing at home. Your dog at home is just walking around sleeping there. They're not coughing unless the collar is tight or else they have some sort of issue or they have some prior injury. They're not going to be coughing. I have dogs here. None of them cough inside the home but some of them once in a while in the past they used to when I take them out for a walk on leash and it's just a regular regular collar just a regular fabric collar there's people who need to use a martingale and a slip for flight risk dogs and absolutely use that have it make sure it's properly sized but a regular fabric collar and, and the uh, a few of the different pet stores have instructed me how to properly put on a fabric collar is where you want to be able to put two fingers in depending on the size like with a Dane it's, it's different right so put two fingers in where it fits in through the collar and it's got to be snug and if it's snug then it's a nice fit they're not gonna be able to pull out as easily if they are that type of dog that backs out and it stays on secure um, we also want the collar around our dog to be snug don't want it loose, we want it snug. And the reason why, and it goes back to one of my uh, um, uh, previous vlogs uh, that I sent to you, Kim, regards to the psychology of uh, buying the proper leash. We want the collar to be snug, not loose, so that way when we're translating, we're, we're, we're doing commands with our leash, which is just a little bit of a flick or a change of direction, or that the dog goes to the end of the leash, the six foot leash, right? Again, it's in that vlog. We want the snugness of the collar to be able to communicate immediately, succinctly, the level of our instruction, of our request for them to comply, of them to obey. And uh, it's not a part of like alpha. I hate to use these terms, but I mean, I'm, I'm trying to keep things simple. So we, we're, we're trying to tell someone something and we want to get their attention. What do we do? We just go over and we tap them on the shoulder. We right? go tap them on the shoulder. We don't go, we just, hey, hey, man, uh, can you, you know, right? We want the snugness of our collar to be able to translate that same aspect of communication. So that way, if it's snug, we're not having to pull back. There's no slack that's there. There's no looseness running around the leash and the collar. And so by the time you pull it, the collar goes snaps back at them. If it's snug, you're not having to rank back on them to communicate to your dog a command or a change of direction. Because it's snug, you just have to give a slight little tug, a slight little tap, and the dog feels it right away. 
Now people say, well, you know, my dog's really reactive; he's not paying attention. Well, that comes again. Go go watch that blog that vlog in regards to the psychology of a of buying a proper leash. When it's a correct, snugly fitted collar, and it has to be weight appropriate. Like I think Amber Cotto uh, had a uh, had uh, foolishly had somebody with a, a great name with a one inch collar, which ended up breaking and the Dane attacked uh, one of my dogs actually. Amber Cotto did that, it was quite foolish of her. Um, so you want to have a weight appropriate collar. It has to be snug so you can translate. Do you ever notice that when you're just walking, your dog's not in a reactive situation, you're just walking, there's nobody else around, there's no reactivity that's going on, sorry my hair's out here, there's no reactivity going on whatsoever, and as you're walking your dog and he's happy and he's not worried about anything, you're walking, walking, you decide to change direction for whatever reason, you go pull him off to the side, you want to walk across the street, you notice you don't have to use much power, your dog immediately makes it, even if your dog's going off the other direction, you just pull him, he comes back with you right away, you don't even have to yank him, he's reacting at a tenth of a second, he feels it and he's immediately adjusting not just his head but his entire body to change direction. That's why people who like Leerberg have no idea what they're talking about when they say you're luring the dog with a leash and you're luring the dog with food. It's an amateur uh, perspective and it's an inexperienced perspective that Leerberg has. And I say that because he's trolled me on my, on my YouTube channel thinking he knows what he's talking about. And I say to him, well, why are you buying your subscribers? Why are you making commercialization of mediocrity? Uh, why are you unable to answer the question, well, how do dogs process time? How do dogs process pain? He doesn't know those answers, so he's mediocre. And I say that because he trolled me and he had no reason to troll me. So that's cool, man. You want to troll me? Go ahead. Whatsoever. I'll, I'll blow you away. Leerberg says, silly, you're luring the dog. The dog is reacting in a tenth of a second. Your dog is able to see your motions and movements instantly. They're able to see another dog and react faster than you can see that's happening because you say the dog reacted unpredictable. So you're not luring the dog. The dog is just paying attention to you. And if you're too slow like Leerberg is, you see how he's kind of really slow and like, He's, he's telegraphing it. He's phoning it all in with his, his videos. You see the direction, the change he does. The dog is already paying attention and it's already seen him making movements of adjustments. And then the dog is treat motivated because he thinks the dog is dumb and he's treat motivating the dog as well. So the dog's just basically like, okay, well, I see where it goes on. And I'm, he thinks the dog's being lured. The dog is actually following him faster than Lerberg can, can move. So snug collar, able to translate movement right away. Why is the dog coughing on leash, right? Your dog's lunging and yeah, you know, uh, I have no comment about that guy because I haven't met him and he's never trolled me. I know Caesar has admitted publicly when it comes to an aggressive dog, he has a, 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 like a really, a true, aggre well, somewhat aggressive because I've seen the person he refers to, uh, this guy, uh, Steve or something in, in um, who works with like, anyways, anyways, long story short, um, Caesar Milan has admitted that he's only limited to a certain type of dog uh, re, uh, reaction, right? Dysfunctional dog, et cetera. Like a, on my scale, he, I think he's up to like a V5 at the most, which is a bite level five dog, according to Ian Dunbar's uh, uh, um, silly scale, a bite scale, where if the dog breaks the skin, then the dog gets killed if he can't respond to treats. I mean, I have dogs who grab me by the top of the head, both temples at the same time. It, it, it's just, it's silly. Um, so what ends up happening is uh, Caesar goes, hey, I can't deal with this dog. It's too much for me. There's somebody else. So that's the difference. At least Caesar has the uh, the humility, the, the humbleness, the modesty to, to admit when a dog is too much for him. Uh, I'm not trying to be an arrogant person by saying, well, look, you're saying that he's humble, but you're not, James. I'm not trying to be an arrogant person, but at the end of the day, I work with the predators. I work with the dogs that watch you. They don't chase you to attack you. They just walk at you. Uh, like I said to Kim, they walk like they're the Terminator. They know where you're going, and they know they're going to catch you no matter what. So why run? Predator. Predator hunts. Stalks. Traps. Um, so, okay. Um, so that's why I talk about these things in the part. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I just, that's my scale. Um, you know, like I said, uh, I think I said to... Um, uh, Amy Rainoshek, who is the founder of uh, uh, the uh, largest Great Dane Rescue in North America, Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue Rehab and Charity Foundation. 
uh, I've already said to her and a few other people like um, Lori over at Peace Love Danes and, and other people in other groups, uh, Dane groups. I am looking for a dog, a Great Dane, 150 plus pounds, 35, 36 inches at the withers minimum, which means they might have a standing height of about 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 10 maybe, uh, uh, if not higher. And they will have to have had attacked at least six, uh, 12 people. I prefer six, well, six to nine minimum, but I prefer more than that. Uh, you know the thing, Zeus, uh, is that a normal behavior for animals that were bred to be our companions? Absolutely. Every single dog is a predator. Even the Chihuahua in the last couple of uh, uh, vlogs I've talked about is that the dogs themselves, when you see them playing with a toy and they're shaking it in their mouth, they're killing, they're disabling their target. That toy is a representation, fantastically thinking in their head, is a target, is prey. So they're disabling it, breaking the spine, etc. The dog that is a truly angry dog, vicious dog, etc. Uh, their behavior, their type of bite uh, consistency, the bite sequencing as well, and where they bite on you is all... Uh, reflective of the dog's processing aspects and uh, emotional behavior. So if a dog is going to grab a toy, you get to see all these things. Yeah, they do put these dogs down after three attacks, sometimes two, etc. Because you got uh, you got people like Rebecca Ledger, who don't uh, Claudia Richter, who don't know what the heck they're talking about, and instead they're saying you can't fix this dog and you can't medicate the right medication, psychological medication, psychopharmaceuticals to deal with a dog's psychological problems. Well, let's take the medication away. And let's actually work with the psychological problems that the dog has, just like Blossom today, right? Really simple. We saw the dependency issues that she has with her paw. We saw her looking and checking back on things. We saw her looking around. We saw her looking around corners. Once you started doing the things I told you to do, she stopped doing all these things. And then instead, when she got amped up, what did she do, Kim? She came to you for that security of your parenting of her. Okay, so I'm going to get back to this coughing because I know Jamie's uh, waiting. Um, so dogs coughing on leash. Again, if the leash is, uh, if, the co if, the, if the collar is snug, then the, then the translating of your commands is happening. And whenever you make a command, every time you ask your dog to go, you know, go left, go right, go straight, heel, stop, go, whatever commands you're doing, good boy, good job. You always want to compliment them. You want to compliment them almost immediately, two-tenths of a second after you've done it. Um, and, and, and you're going, well, two-tenths of a second is really fast. It makes it like, you know, let's go left. Good boy. You're like, uh, that's two-tenths of a second. It's similar to the silly part of the intermediate bridging, terminal bridging. They don't even understand this concept, you know, because they're still amateurs on their tricycles with two wheels. Intermediate bridging is essentially getting to the point of, of intuitive, intuitive processing on our end because i've said to people well you know i didn't know what intermediate bridging means and so i had to google it and they're talking about intermediate bridging where you do a reaction to the dog's reaction right you know the dog does this you do this and you kind of reward the dog etc and then i said to one trainer i said but are you not noticing that you're you're actually catching it faster and shorter time frame of catching and then eventually you're actually predicting it's going to happen and he goes yeah and i said it's not intermediate bridging man it's your intuition and he's like, oh, right. We just need people to recognize this. And we're getting to these trainers and behaviors. We're getting to the, the ledgers and the, and the priors and all these uh, all these silly people who are just, oh, yeah, you keep, it's like, Durr. Uh, you're killing dogs. You're, you're part of the actual problem. Tacitly, you're actually part of the problem. Yeah, I saw that. I mean, that, that's absolutely disgusting. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> so with the collar... Um, it's just a, a regular fabric collar. I mean, now you have people using martingales and uh, slip collars, again, for flight risk. And I have that for one of my flight risk dogs. And then eventually, once he is comfortable with being on a leash, then I end up changing him to just a regular collar. But in the beginning, and the other problem too is some of them will bite me because they're not, they don't want to be touched at all. And then they will attack me. So I'll just use a regular collar, a uh, regular slip for then. And then, then, you know, there's times where I'm trying to get the slip lead off and I'm using like some tongs to pull it off because I know he'll attack me. And then he sees the tongs, he attacks the tongs and he sees my hand attached to the tongs and then he goes after my hand. I'm like, oh geez. And then I have to stop there and be like, stop. And then I'm like, okay. And then if he, if and when he bites me, I'm like, all right. And I got to calm myself down and I start working on it again. Um, but uh, yeah, so Zeus, uh, I should get back to that part. The kind of collar that you're going to, uh, that I use um, on the Danes, two inch fabric collar. 
Uh, if you have ones that are a, a heavier, stronger Dane, then you're going to want to use a buckle collar because if you're a lot of these buckles, like this, uh, this the, the silly uh, trainer Amber Cotto here in Vancouver, I think she calls this the BC Academy of Dog Training and all that stuff. I was like, now you're your own academy. Wow, that's amazing, Supergirl. Um, <laughs> is recommending wrong collars. And then the collar is not strong enough, or it's just a, a, a or an ornamental collar type that the plastic is not strong enough, and then the plastic breaks open, the clip breaks open, the dog escapes from the collar, and then ends up uh, attacking another dog or person. Um, so if you use a dog, uh, if you use a collar on a dog that is a heavy dog, uh, I have Anthony here. He's about 160 pounds now. He's 19 months of age. He's up for adoption. He is a very strong pulling dog, and if I use a regular fabric collar eventually it'll just wear through so I have to use a buckle collar and it's kind of tough for me because I don't eat meat so uh, he has a leather collar that he came with so I use that leather collar on him it's only an inch unfortunately so I use the second collar to distribute the weight and command on it and then he does that uh, with the prong collar you don't want to use a prong collar I've talked about this before if it comes to trainer behaviors they should not be using a prong collar at all because you're hiring someone to be your professional. You're hiring someone to tell you what to do. Yeah, and there's no need for an e-collar as well. So imagine this. Imagine this, Zeus. If you were just walking around and you got stung by a bee. For no, You didn't see a, bee, a bee's nest, a hornet's nest, nothing. You got stung by a bee. You're like, holy crap, and it hurts. And then you're walking again. And you're just walking again, and, and you got stung again by a bee. And then five, six Paces down, you got stung by a bee. By the time you're finished walking, you've got stung by 15, 16 bees. And then tomorrow, the next day, you go out, you go out for a walk again, and you get stung again by a dozen bees over 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And you're like, what the heck? And, oh, that's why, yeah, see, okay, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, and then you go out for a walk the second day and the third day. And every time you go out, you're getting stung by a bee. You're getting stung by a bee. You're getting stung by a bee. You eventually will go, I'm not going out there because I'm going to get stung by a bee again. I don't know where it's coming from. What the heck is coming in from? I have no idea what's going on. When it, when it comes to a professional, Zeus, a use of a prong collar and an e-collar is a brute force device that is used by an unskilled professional. I know you don't want to say that. You probably spent a couple grand on this uh, board and train guy. Minky's, uh, you know, Minky didn't go to any of the board and train people in Los Angeles. And there's lots of good ones out there. A lot of master dog trainers, a lot of well-known behaviors that have board and train. The cost of Minky's rehab for one month would have been over $9,000 US. It would have taken them probably two and a half to three months to even get him anywhere. And if they used an e-collar on him, he would have been completely freaked out and scared. The great Dane Tonka that I had, they, uh, one of the owners used an e-collar on him to train him down from being resource guarding with food not only did it turn uh, Tonka into a quivering drooling fearful dog with that particular owner when Tonka got owned adopted by another owner because he had six different owners in 19 months of age Tonka then after that became extremely dangerous with resource guarding and in fact he attacked somebody who walked by his food bowl and the person who walked by the food bowl knew he wasn't supposed to or knew they weren't supposed to go through they got attacked in the face and needed plastic surgery so this e collar may work with you, may work with a professional, but at the end of the day, psychologically, it's disruptive to the dog because you're not responding to the dog's behavior in the psychological processing, you're responding to brute force behavior. If you want someone to do something for you, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, join my uh, reactive dog group and, and I'll put the uh, link up for uh, how to understand the psychology of the dog with buying the proper leash and when you see it because you're talking about dominant leash control and I said it to Kim today wait till you read it and you'll be like holy crap I just saved you $300 in dog training and you'll see the leash aspect is going to work and again if you post in my closed group like I'm going to do with Jamie then I'll explain to you why and I'll give you a free session like this pro bono that's why I say please follow my YouTube channel uh, I ask people to do so. All this stuff is done for free. It's but what we need to do. I also believe in God. So it's what we need to do to, to help make the world a better place. Um, okay, so uh, the behavior aspects that you're talking about, your dog and the collar and all that stuff, uh, these things are are going to be relatively easy to deal with. Uh, I've dealt with dogs here who are significant, hundred, you know, even a 160-pound dog digging in momentum, power, is going to dig in two to three times their body weight. So a 150-pound dog is going to be generating 450 pounds of digging power. Just... 
digging in power. If they're lunging or if they're running at the end of the lead, you can imagine that momentum is going to drive the dog even faster and harder. Hi, Sammy. <laughs> You're going to drive the, the dog even harder and faster as that dog yanks away. And another thing that I use with every single dog that I've ever worked with, no matter how dangerous, how predatory, how skittish they are, retractable leashes. And people say retractable leashes aren't great and all that stuff. It's like they break at the end and all that stuff. And it's like, well, what do you think? If you let a dog just run full bore and say it's a 50-pound dog and they're running full bore, they're going to generate two to 300 pounds of momentum, even more so depending on how fast and how low to the ground they are. you got a little piece of plastic inside the retractable uh, I'm sorry, a piece of metal inside the retractable, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to break, right? Physics. So that's why. And also, uh, retractables, if you're paying attention, it'll happen. Many times where, where I've dropped a retractable, just like I've dropped a regular leash, it all happens. We're all human. But the retractable just means a lot of experience to use it. Um, okay, so back to the collar, because I want to get to Jamie's. Uh, you're welcome, Zeus. <laughs> you just want to have a regular 2-inch collar. That's it. Get a regular 2-inch collar for a Great Dane. If you have a smaller dog, then you go and ask the, the people at the pet store, well, this is my dog, this kind of weight, this is what they're kind of like on lead. They pull a bit, what should I get? They might get you to buy a harness, which is always expensive, but if they, you know, it's up to you. Then they'll give you a weight appropriate collar. And you want to look at the directions and then, I mean, the instructions, it'll say, you know, this collar is good for a 125 pound dog. And then it's like, okay, that's cool. It's okay to kind of buy a heavier collar if you're not that comfortable. Uh, at the end of the day, you want it to be snug so you can do the translation of the power. And then you see the dog is lunging all the time. And, he, and you know, even if you're just walking with him, the leash is loose, and you don't see anybody around and no dog around. And say you have a dog reactive dog, right? You know, like that. Or like all the dogs I get here, except for Sammy, and she used to be, are all dog reactive. And they are predatorial dog reactive, as I said to Kim. The eyes change when they are attempting to kill another dog. They're not trying to hurt the other dog. They're trying to kill the other dog. They're not even making noise. When you see two dogs barking and fighting and the fight rah, 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 and the fighting and the bark rah, rah, rah. predatorial dogs don't make sounds. They don't need to. They're focused. It's really quite scary. It's very very freaking scary. And, and I told Kim today about one of the incidences that I had. Um, okay, so uh, the, you see the dog, right? Your dog's on a leash. You're walking. There's nobody around. And then all of a sudden, you know, you don't see it. And all of a sudden, your dog sees another dog down the road. And again, your dog is dog reactive. So what do you do? You just loose leash, and all of a sudden, your dog just jerks right at the end of it and runs the full six feet of the lead and it goes like that and they're like that and, they're rah, 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 and, they're, and the dog is at the end of the lead and they're barking and they're yelling at the other dog rah, 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 trying to kill the other dog which is a lot of uh, comes back to the defensive aspect of the dog's instinctive behavior you got to watch my vlogs man now, all this stuff is here so, so the dog's like rah, 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 and they're going all over the place and the other dog walks away the owner's like holy cow that guy's crazy dog and i'm like walking away and then the or they walk past across the street and your dog is like all over the thing and they're going behind you they're trying to get the other dog and they're like, rah, 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 and you're holding on the lead, and you're like, please stop. And you're like, rah, 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 and the dog's all over the place, and then the dog's all back, there, and then nothing happens, right? And he's just walking, and your dog's like, la, 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 la. Other dogs that feel insecure, having difficulty dysfunction wise, will start to cough. And you think, oh my gosh, right? They're pulling on the lead and hurt their throat or maybe they have kennel cough or something's gone on. Take them to the vet and the vet says, no, you don't. Here you go. Here's some medication. Make you feel better. Here's $150 medication. Vet visit, et cetera, et cetera, right? Here's the thing is, if, if it was like free health care for dogs, vets would be like, please don't send your dog with a cough. Check this out first. Check this out first. Check this out first before you bring them. But of course, it's that you do the do to the to your you know free healthcare in Canada. You can go to the uh, to the doctors, and a lot of times they start putting out things like, "Well, don't go to the doctor if you think this is it. Here's a free helpline instead." Okay, so we look at the cost. We look at the value of why this is happening. So your dog is coughing, and they're like, <coughs> and all that. It's psychosomatic most times on the dysfunctional dog's behavior. It's your dog's desire for you. To ask them if they're okay. Those of you who have hired me. Who have dogs. That have coughed. And so forth like that. Have, will say the same thing. You're right James. Once you pointed that out. And once I address it in a, in a certain way. That is relative to the dog. They stop coughing. They're not coughing anymore. They haven't coughed in a week. They haven't coughed in a month. 
<laughs> yeah, Robitussin, right? Like Eddie Murphy said. Um, so the uh, Zeus, sorry, I'm just t- saying the Zeus is, oh, yeah. Well, I grew up Chinese. How do you think that felt? I got Tiger Bomb all the time. Um, so the dog is running at the lead. You, if you've ever seen a dog in the backyard that's on a chain or leash, right? It's a horrible thing, but it's a reactive dog. And you're walking by and the dog's reacted to humans. And you walk by and the dog will rush you. And they'll rush to the end of the, of the leash and even yank themselves back from, the, from the, the whiplash, right? The recoil. And they'll just stand there. And either they're barking or they're not barking. And they stand there. And you could stand there. And you could stand there for an hour. They won't cough once. Psychosomatic. The dog lunging at the lead almost always on a dysfunctional basis is lunging at the lead and is coughing because they're looking for you to feed into their anxiety, their insecurity, their unsecurity, their aspects of self-worth, different dysfunctions for this dog's behavior. Like I said to Kim, right? You know, I, I say to everybody, there's a, there's a core group of steps that I do with every dog. Everyone, and it'll address probably 70% of dog owners with reactive dogs, which I estimate to about 40% of the population has reactive dogs. So out of a out of a 99.4 million, we're talking about 40 million dogs are reactive. And you think, like, well, that's a lot, right? Because that's how many in North America. But you walk down the street, how many times have you seen people like they see and they start turning around and, and all that stuff? <laughs> oh, Faith, uh, uh, Faith out in uh, Hawaii. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, when you watch the, the one about the leash control, you're going to be like, wow, this is cool. You're going to see about aspects. There's no such thing as dominant dog on leash. You, you're going to be like, this is just wow. Like I say, in the, in the stuff you practice, you'll be able to. <laughs> okay. So so the dog is like jerking it and I'm like that and yanking on the thing. And they're like, wow, well, whatever. There's no audience there. They're not trying to look for that because the dog then understands the codependency aspect of affection. Right, all these behaviors. The scientists are saying, "Oh, the dog has learned to adapt to the human." Be-. No, the dog hasn't learned. The dog just understands that you're providing an emotional context through the codependent aspect relationship. Durr, right? Sorry, I, I got to bring myself down from that back to lay person's thing. Um, oh, oh, I got 15 percent uh, here. Okay, I apologize. Um, all right, so so the the dog, your dog. When they're coughing, is a psychosomatic. It, it's them attempting to have you give them affection. So when that does happen. Uh, when you when you when you, that stuff does happen, stop feeding into that part of their insecurity, and instead do a corrective aspect of it. But again, you, you'll see the fact that again, when your dog is lunging and darting out the leash, they don't usually cough. And then after a while, they'll be like, uh, and they'll see something, and they'll try to correct themselves, and they'll go, <coughs> and they'll start coughing on purpose because they're trying to control their behavior by saying, "You need to take care of me, mom. You need to take care of me, dad." You take your dog to the vet, your vet goes, yeah, 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 yeah. you hear some some stuff. Um, and the reason why I say CBD oil in James, CBD oil in Canada can't be prescribed by vets. So that's why vets don't suggest it because they're not allowed to. They're not allowed to subscribe or prescribe anything that is not legal, that is not permitted by their, uh, by their college. And uh, on my end, I know there's vets that I've worked with before with their dogs. But they they said they can't refer me because I'm not approved by the science-based garbage that these treat training uh, dysfunctional aspects are happening. So then what ends up happening is they're like, well, we can't deal with the stuff that goes on, etc. But the the crazy thing is, you look how long CBD oil was a, was attacked. Um, Jane Goodall, when it came to the primates, and she was giving them names instead of numbers, and she was ridiculed and laughed at. I just see myself in the same mandate of what I'm doing with the dogs because I prove it at 100% of the dogs that I work with, behaviors and animal scientists and PhDs and, and master dog trainers are only successful upwards of 60% of the same spectrum of dogs. Uh, and, and again, um, anybody in Vancouver, don't believe me, whatever, ch- challenge me. I'll accept any challenge. I'll take any dog that you want to talk about. This is me in person on camera, live, saying, bring any dog to me. Absolutely. And then you get to work with one of my dogs. Same aspects, same introduction that I had as well. No treats, no medication, no prong collars, no nothing. 
we'll compare. Not one person has ever accepted it. Even the uh, couple of guys that's, uh, the guy who runs, I think, Smash Face Dog Rescue or whatever it is, Smash Mouth Rescue in, in L.A., challenged him. He was coming after me. I said, dude, come on out. I'll even pay for your flight up here. Come out and show me. I'll come down there. Didn't take any of my offers. Didn't give me a challenge. CBDO is absolutely amazing. Okay, so Jamie, I'm going to go to this because I don't know how much time. And, I'm, and if my battery runs out, I'll try to restart off my computer. Uh, okay, you know what I'm going to do? Let me just see if I can do something else here. Uh, I'm going to switch over. Okay, for those of you who are watching this, I'm going to switch over to my desktop. Okay, I'm going to switch over to my desktop. So uh, um, let me just do that here. So I'm going to do that right now just so I don't lose uh, Jamie in the middle of this uh, this aspect of it. Okay, so I'm just going to put on, um, oh shoot, I better do this, okay. Uh, let me just see here. Control A. All right. Sorry guys. Put it on here. And, sorry, I just got to switch this over. I'm not great with technology today, or usually. And I've got a computer that's like 9, 10 years of age. It's a really old computer desktop computer that uh, my ex-girlfriend gave me okay so i'm gonna go live again so i'm just gonna get you guys switch over and it'll and now i'm live on the other one now as well so uh for any and i can't see comments on it unfortunately because for some odd reason it doesn't show comments in the other other end so I, i'm gonna try to uh try to figure this out somehow okay so uh those of you who are watching this please switch over to my other live broadcast and you'll see me talking obviously in front of my cell phone uh, on a stand and um, you should be able to see that so it's just going broadcast now 25 seconds in and then I'll be able to continue off of that so um, yeah I'm broadcasting hopefully I don't know I can't even tell if anyone's watching because um, this is the way the thing goes so I'm just going to kind of do both if it runs out we'll just switch over whatever right okay um, let me just see here blah 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 okay all right, so uh, Jamie asked the question um, in regards to her two Great Danes that she has. Plus, she also has a lab as well. And Jamie says, uh, I am a, a subscriber to your YouTube channel, which I always ask people to do so if that's the case. And um, let me just switch out here. Uh, I follow all your groups on Facebook, Instagram, and shared your page on Facebook. So thank you so much, Jamie. Um, again, like I say, it really helps me uh, get the word out and to teach the world the difference. So I'm going to break it down as I go down. So I'm just going to work on it organically. I'm looking for help. And I, I read it once today. And I did look at the pictures in the video and all that stuff. So it says here, I'm looking for help. Um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to catch this. I'm looking for help for my two-and-a-half-year-old male great Dane Daxton. He's uh, up to date on vaccinations, no medical issues. And his thyroid is uh, within normal limits, WNL. We have had him since eight weeks. Always had a good life with solid training in our home. We also have a, a double Merle Great Dane. Double Merle is when they breed Merles out of the right, wrong gene, and then they become either blind and or deaf. Um, Wyatt, Wyatt is deaf with vision impairments, one and a half years of age. So there's Wyatt is one and a half years old. There's Daxon that is two and a half years of age. And then, um, okay, we will neuter him on February 2020, which is great to wait to two years to, if you can, uh, to neuter a dog because then that way, is not affecting their, their hips and it's just more beneficial and less less likelihood of getting cancer and other types of diseases because of the hormone balance that, that continues onward. Ultimately, if you could just leave your dog unneutered would be good, but it's not a good idea because of pregnancy and, and uh, unwanted dogs, right? There's 6 million dogs killed annually in North America. Okay, so we rescued him as a pup. So rescued Wyatt as a pup at 12 weeks. Uh, six, uh, and we have a six-year-old lab, four kids, ages 10 to 20, and then two adults. All three dogs view my fiance Chuck as a leader. The three dogs will all pile on the love seat to be close to him and follow him around every time he moves throughout the house. Daxon's personality seems to be the protector of all and the rule, enforce, rule enforcer in our household. Sorry, I'm just trying to read this from far away. Uh, he seem, uh, Daxon seems to be, uh, his personality seems to be the protector of all and rule enforcer in our household. He immediately took on the role of mother hen when we rescued Wyatt at 12 weeks of age, right? Because Wyatt is, is, is uh, hearing and vision impaired. Uh, you know, Tonka was like that too as well. He was beaten so badly, he, he lost 20% vision, 10% hearing loss, and slight brain damage, which already makes a giant dog that's reactive pretty darn dangerous um, on top of everything else. Okay, so um, uh, Daxon, he will go find Wyatt, quote-unquote, find Wyatt, find Wyatt, go get Wyatt. Right, so Daxon will find Wyatt, 
um, and because Wyatt's deaf, so Daxon will go and find him if it's time for all three dogs to come to the house. If Wyatt or one of the uh, kids gets too ramped up, Daxon will place himself in between who he is protecting and what he is protecting from Daxton. So if Daxon's uh, at threat, then he'll protect Daxton from what he perceives from the other kids. Uh, his other human siblings and basically what is happening as well as Daxon will then maybe step in front of the other kid or one other kid if that kid is being somewhat you know overwhelmed by everything else uh, and Daxon appears always to be on alert and watching what is going on and who is doing what overall he is a loving happy Dane so right off the bat there um, Jamie um, Daxon is not the protector Daxon is not the rule enforcer what Daxon is and I read when I read this the first time and I read it through once was are you ready He's a little brother. He's not the fun police. He's not the sheriff. He's a little brother. He's the one that feels that he has to take care of people in case they get too wild and get out of the way. They can't control things. Daxon has to come in and he doesn't want to come in, but he has to come in and protect. In the sense of not being the protector and alpha and the fun police, but as in the little brother that says, hey, I'm, I'm just doing this, but I don't really want to. Right. Okay. And I got that because of the other stuff that you wrote down as well. Okay. So yes. Right. So there we go on that part. 85% of the time, Daxon is best friends with our DM. Uh, um, Jamie, make sure you're watching it on the other thing because if it runs out, then I'm going to keep talking, not realize I'm still talking. Um, okay. 85% uh, of the time, Daxon is best friends with uh, with Wyatt, right? The double Merle, partially blind, uh, he uh, hearing impaired. Well, he's hearing impaired. I mean, he's deaf and he's partially blind. Right, vision issues. They play well together and coexist in our home for most of the part. Since Wyatt has turned nine to ten months of age, at times Daxon will growl at Wyatt when he gets close to him if he's on the couch, on the bed, or on the floor sucking on a blanket. So Daxon sucking on the blanket against the codependency issue. I haven't talked about that as per se. I've talked about dogs nipping and etc. and etc. Oh, uh, if you go back to my Facebook page and refresh it, then you'll see. Uh, um, yeah, you guys just refresh everything and then you'll see it live. Uh, again on my Facebook page uh, and it'll reshow itself on and you'll see me obviously two screens now right um, uh, well not two screens but two two cameras woohoo I'm I'm high budget today um, okay so um, uh, okay my battery just ran out all right so uh, everybody refresh your Facebook my Facebook page and then you'll see me on the new one um, because my battery's uh, I've got five percent now it's just dimmed right out so uh, please go to my Facebook page refresh it and then you'll see me talking. So I'm just going to put this away. I'll give you guys a few seconds and I'll continue, um, uh, Jamie. And um, I have to actually create uh, a, a new window as well because I won't be able to see what's going on myself unless I, I myself refresh as well. So uh, let me just pull this out here. Okay, so I'm down to 4%. And, uh, okay. So let me just see here. So I'm just refreshing my page, which is going to take a little while. My computer's so slow, it's so old. Okay, so there we go. So I'm um, myself refresh it. Okay, okay, cool. Oops. So, uh, mm, here we go. Okay. Here. So I'm on here. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to switch over, everybody. Uh, I apologize. Um, 